Ladies and gentlemen, as regular viewers will probably know, I am residing in Seattle currently, or it's more accurate to say I'm on holiday here and also doing some work while seeing friends. Seattle is one of the tech capitals of the United States. Many large companies have their headquarters in the area, and I decided to reach out to a couple of them. One of the companies which I have managed to snag an interview with then is Puget Systems. Puget Systems, for those unfamiliar, create high-performance computers designed for workstations, for media creation, scientific computing, and so on. Although they do also design computers and build them for gamers too. Do know that this is not a sponsored video, and I reached out to Puget Systems, but they were gracious enough to organize an interview with the owner of the business, John Buck, and he also gave me a tour of their facilities, which I have to say are very impressive. Puget Systems don't do the typical route when it comes to building computers. Instead, they don't put in a whole bunch of LED lights and that type of stuff. Instead, they focus on performance and quiet systems. So, they have laboratories where they use thermal cameras to see the flow of heat in any hot pockets in the system of air. They also have rigorous testing procedures, and honestly speaking, it was really cool to get to check out their facilities. So, I'm going to be quiet now and let the interview play. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here at Puget Systems with... I'm John Bach, the founder and president of Puget Systems here in Auburn, Washington, just south of Seattle. Okay. Uh, so, John, you've been around for 18 years 18 now. 18 years, yeah. Okay, so what do you currently specialize in and uh, what type of uh, things are you really finding customers are really interested in yeah. at the moment? Well, so we are, we're very passionate about uh, three focuses, uh, content creation, engineering, and, and scientific computing. And so we design and manufacture workstations for those specific use cases. So that would be primarily for... Uh, businesses and individuals who are focused on that. So I'm assuming that reliability would be incredibly important in those areas. Yeah, I mean, to, especially for these use cases, what really gets us out of bed every morning is uh, the job our clients are doing, because there's some really cool work going on out there in, in content creation, whether it's like a YouTuber or an independent film artist that's uh, you know directing a movie or uh, with engineering, somebody's designing houses, skyscrapers, uh, satellites, it's really cool use cases. Um, and in scientific computing, I mean, there's breakthroughs going on with cancer research and machine learning and self-driving cars and <laughs> really interesting stuff. And that's what's important to us. And so the computer is a tool to get the job done. Mm -hmm. So it has to perform and it has to be reliable. One of the things that I did notice as we were going through the facility earlier, you were giving me the penny tour, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> is that you have a very rigorous, uh, stringent quality control process as well as building process. So did you want to quickly walk that through for the audience? Yeah. I mean, so what's, what's important to us, again, is that the job is being done. And, and so we tailor our testing process to the specific use cases. So if you're getting a, a workstation from us and it's being used for like rendering videos you, from red 4K footage, like, that's what we're going to test. Uh, testing for the specific application because we found that that's actually a challenge in and of itself. A one-size-fits-all computing. I mean, those days are over. Um, hardware is very diverse. Software is very diverse. And you can't apply a one-size-fits-all approach anymore. Um, so the, the specialty and like the, the, the secret sauce that we bring to the industry is that we need to know the workflow of our users so we have to really like, really understand content creation video editing post-production vi visual effects uh, rendering we have to understand all of that because we have to tailor our testing processes to make sure that that job can be done reliably so obviously that means that you have to employ the best people as well and people with experience on that type of area and provide a lot of, of training yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so how does it work let's say that i was to call your sales representative mm -hmm. and let's say well I wanted to create a system for 3d rendering or 3d animation yeah what type of questions would they ask me um, well so each of our of our technology consultants have like an area of expertise mm -hmm. um, because you can't be a jack of all trades no. and, and really get into the details so we'd first identify like what type of workstation what type of workflow you're using and we'd write you to the appropriate um, representative and from there they'll start asking like detailed questions you probably will never be asked by another hardware vendor. Uh, what codecs are you using? What programs are you using? What what type of, uh, so like if you're doing, 
uh, CAD design, how many uh, data points are in your, your models. Like a, a model for something very simple is a very different kind of computer than somebody modeling a skyscraper. Mm -hmm. And so we'll ask those very detailed questions. What is your budget? Um, Oftentimes it, it gets complicated because some people don't buy computers for one use. It's for multiple uses. If you're a video editor, you probably spend time in After Effects and Photoshop as well. So we have to find that balance because a Photoshop machine is very different from a rendering machine. Mm -hmm. And so we have to find that balance. So yeah, they'll have in-depth conversations. I think you'll be surprised. Like challenge us actually. If you're if you're in one of those spaces, call us up and, and challenge us because uh, uh, we really do. Uh, we have to. Uh, uh, eat, breathe, and sleep, you know, th this, uh, this stuff. So they ask all those questions. We have a detailed conversation. And with the information they glean in that conversation, we can design the best workstation for you specifically. Right. So would you say that the market has changed significantly over the past several years that you've noticed? I mm -hmm. um, refer mostly here to HPC usage, like machine learning and... 3D rendering a CAD, would you say that the market has changed significantly? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in so many different ways. I mean, first of all, the competitive landscape, like even like Intel versus AMD, like that's changed a lot. And that makes our job more complicated. <laughs> you know, so there's just more ingredients we, we, we can deal with that can get the job done. Um, so there's that. And then, yes, um, of these various segments, like engineering is uh, a lot of smooth to the cloud. And um, so we have to we have to also know the cloud to know when it's actually not a good idea to buy a workstation. We have to know our strengths and our weaknesses. And yeah, boy, machine learning. Like scientific computing is basically machine learning these days. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, there's, there's molecular dynamics and, and fluid dynamics and simulation. And uh, medical but, research as well is becoming incredibly popular right yeah, now. Yeah, and so much of that is machine learning. I mean, yeah. um, it, what's happening in, so for example, like um, eye uh, recognition of, of eye diseases. You, know, you can now take photos of the eye and machine learning algorithms have surpassed human diagnosis rates. That's, that's really isn't? cool, and it's, and it's fun to be a part of that. That's that's what gets us excited. Uh, because I was uh, recently interviewing Neil Trebert, who obviously is uh, one of the heads of uh, Kronos Group and also works at NVIDIA, and obviously one of their passions is well, self-driving, AI, mm -hmm. and he was telling me some of the amazing stuff that is you know coming over the next several years. We've obviously, we're seeing now the inter integration of uh, computing in, well, cars where they yeah. can self drive themselves and uh, even you know the safety rates are just so high mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's it's incredible really just what type of technology we're going to be seeing over the next several years with medical research augmented reality and all of this stuff yeah. so it yeah. must be really exciting to be part of that yeah it is and and right now we're kind of in a um, golden era I feel like mm -hmm. for, for all of that because it is it's whole new use cases for technology and right now, that is very developer heavy. A lot of developer workstations in autonomous driving and, and medical research and, and whatnot. And so that's where we, where we, speci we specialize um, in, in making those boxes because these are use cases that are like brand new. And so they need somebody with a fresh eye like us that can come in and tailor you know, the hardware for your specific application. Like in machine learning, that's kind of just a concept. We need to actually get into how your code scales exactly. in machine order to know. Is such a generic, it, it, it's a casual term. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what is machine? Yeah, it's like buying a server. Like, well, a server for what? <laughs> and so you, you have to get into the details to get it right. You were also telling me earlier as well that uh, a lot of uh, customers, you're actually recommending the GeForce lineup of cards rather than even Quadro a lot of the time. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. could you explain why that is? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, with, with, with what the, hard, the performance needs are today, um, it's all about you know wh what is the best bang for the buck from a performance standpoint, which is a very different thing when you're in development phase than when you're in production phase. Absolutely, like once once machine learning algorithms or even like rendering farms get to the cloud and they get to the data center, then you need the the reliability and service contracts and whatnot that you find through Quadro and Tesla. It's all more murky when you're in the developer phase uh, because you can actually get a lot of performance, oftentimes more performance. From the GeForce side, um, and so we, you know, we have to have that conversation with every customer to see not only what is their application, but what kind of phase they're in. Are they in just testing things out? Are they developing and writing code, or is this like fully rolled out and they have a data center application? The answer is different uh, mm -hmm. depending on where they are. That's pretty cool, though. The fact that um, we're seeing such performance for consumer level cards, and obviously that's going to be even perhaps better with the. RTX 20 series mm -hmm, when it becomes mm -hmm. readily available because even the TIs or TIs are not currently available for uh, 
purchase as of the time we're recording right, right, this. Right, right, this moment, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's about a week, isn't it? And I think they've started rolling onto Stalker. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. this NVIDIA delay it again. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we get the same thing um, from, like, from Intel uh, Xeon versus Core. Uh, there's so much you can do with Core these days. And when we have single socket 18 core systems, yeah, right. it's actually really cool that we can take what traditionally needed to be dual or even quad socket systems and can get them down into a single socket machine, not only for cost, but it's better performance. You don't have to scale the cores across a, a QPI or a UPI link, just a simpler architecture overall. I, for example, the Threadripper, the 2990WX, mm -hmm. it must be very disruptive. I mean, 64 threads, 32 cores. Uh -huh. Yeah. It, it must have kind of torpedoed the market in some areas for workstations because you're looking at that type of thing and obviously it's competing even against that own epic lineup i mean there are obviously some differences like memory channels and stuff like that but uh -huh. for most people that it's that level more of than they would ever need yeah yeah when you start looking at 64 threads it's it's very exciting stuff and, yeah uh, we were seeing one uh, customer earlier when they were building like 25 systems or something mm -hmm. like that and you know you've got all these multiple xeon processes and so on but you're right not everyone needs that mm -hmm. you know it's it's a regular processor is quite often more than sufficient for most yeah. of the most of the work. Well, I'm sure your audience already understands, but it's amazing how much the world doesn't understand that more expensive is not faster. Yeah, um, I, we could build you a dual Xeon dual socket system that is significantly slower than an 8700K <laughs> for Photoshop. So it's about knowing the application and knowing is it single threaded, multi threaded? How does it scale? You have to look at Amdahl's law, which is really cool. It talks about how how applications scale over, over multiple cores. And yeah, I mean, the fun part for us is when somebody's been buying HP boxes for years, buying like dual Xeon boxes, and we can come in and say, oh, you know, we can actually do something at one quarter of the price that performs better because it's actually designed for your use case instead of a one size fits all. It must be kind of difficult for them to swallow as well. There must be a little bit of like hesitation. There. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things we do is we publish all of our results publicly so that there isn't like a trust us factor. It's, <laughs> it's like, look at the data for yourselves and um and yeah i mean yeah sometimes sometimes it's hard to believe but after you get the first box then then you're good to go i have noticed as well that you are very open with the testing results and uh one of the things that i did think rather innovative uh, when i was when i was reading about it in particular mm -hmm. was the fact that you use thermal imaging for testing the computers before you ship them out make sure there's no hot spots make sure all the components are working because obviously you might just have you know possibly a graphics card that when it was manufactured there was a manufacturing defect the fans aren't working correctly you yeah. know the vrms are faulty or whatever and it's putting out way more heat than what it should be or you know maybe there's an issue with the motherboard and i think that's really cool that you uh, do that yeah thanks what was the actual idea behind that like how did you come up with that idea uh originally it was because and we still are very focused on quiet uh computers quiet workstations and that's actually sometimes challenging to do when you take enterprise class hardware because nobody makes <laughs> a server and says like we need a quiet server and so we but we do that and and even if we're taking like um a quadro and like enterprise class platter drives and putting them into a tower, it's, it's still important to us. Like that's gonna be at your desk, in your lab, in your studio. And so it does need to be quiet. Thermal imaging is one of the many tools we used to get to the bottom of that and fight, figure out, okay, the primary way that you can make a machine quieter is to be very efficient with the cooling. It's actually staggering how many computers have fans that are completely unnecessary. And so we have very targeted fans. We use brackets to put the fans exactly where we need them. And thermal imaging informs that whole process. I guess this is kind of going into a slightly different topic, but it makes a lot of sense to ask, what about cryptocurrency mining? Yeah. Did you guys get tempted to kind of jump in on that craze? Because obviously, you know, you had motherboard manufacturers that were, you know, the, the PCIe slots were coming. Like, yeah. I'm pretty sure they were yeah. like stuffing them in the yeah. in the box at this point. It was ridiculous how many PCIe slots they were doing, and obviously, so many uh, companies were so happy to sell you systems that were based upon cryptocurrency. Was that just something you didn't want to jump in because you felt it was going to be like a flash in the pan? Or yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of personal, I guess, right. opinions built, built into that question. Um, overall, though, we did build some boxes. I mean, we're, we're a custom computer manufacturer, and there's a number of things people can do with our boxes, and I'm sure we, we sold a fair number of crypto boxes. One of the reasons why we didn't go, like, proactively go after it is because of how important we feel like it is to keep our eye on the ball. Um, it's really important to us, content creation, engineering, scientific computing. 
If it doesn't fit one of those things, uh, we would rather do a very good job in those verticals than to dilute our focus and not be as good at what we do. Right, and obviously those three areas are always going to be able to, you know, you're always going to be able to sell the computers in those areas, right? Yeah, well, there's, a, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why we service those areas is we see a long future ahead for that, and we see a big need. Um, it's, 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 you could, you can go almost anywhere and find a good gaming box, or finding a number of vendors that sell you a gaming box to have a vendor that actually specializes in these three applications. We saw that there was like a void um, that, that we could, uh, we could fill that role. That's what we do. So what actually spurred you to move towards that section rather than gaming? Yeah. Well, you know, I think one of the tipping points was in 2008 and the recession. Um, even prior to that, though, like we were doing a lot of consumer PCs and gaming PCs back then, but we were always like the boring one. <laughs> you know, we didn't do the, the lights and the windows and the liquid cooling, the hard light and tubing and that type of thing. Um, and uh, we were always motivated by reliability over all else. And yes, we sold a number of gaming boxes like that. In the recession of, of 2008, though, um, the gaming, like, it was very extravagant prior to that. And, and I feel like gaming got a lot more responsible um, after that, which was a good thing. Um, I don't yeah. know. Look at the price of the new car. Well, that's true. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been a long time since 2008 at this point. But that was, that was kind of a tipping point for us where we already had all of the qualities. Like, the things that were important to us were already there, built into our business. And we, it was almost like to, the recession caused us to, to find our passion. And that's where we really got heavy into the workstation side of things. What would you say the biggest surprises have been for you over the past couple of years in terms of the computing space? Not necessarily in terms of sales and business, but more like the big surprises that kind of happened to you in terms of like, well, I didn't expect that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think just how complicated everything has gotten. And I don't know if I'm just changing over time or if the industry is changing. No, it's getting more complex. <laughs> getting, I'm yeah. pretty sure. <laughs> um, I mean, not only on the hardware side, but the software side. It, it used to be that you could get a box and it would be like reasonably good at a number of things. And the deeper that we dig into these use cases, into like if you're doing video editing for red 8K footage versus if you're doing H.264 rendering, it's a totally different beast. And so the kind of the further down the rabbit hole we go, the more complicated it, it gets, which is also a big opportunity for us because we can have these conversations now. Our, our tech consultants have to be educated in codecs and wrappers and, and export formats and, and all these things because it's important now. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think just the, the complexity of the whole industry is... Um, is interesting to me. It's, it's both a blessing and a curse. Like it's an opportunity because people need companies like us, but it's also kind of a shame that things can't be more simple. And obviously now you're getting AMD being competitive in the CPU market space, yep. and you've got yep. Intel going to be jumping into the GPU market space. Yes, that's so, right. Yes. And it's yes. just, it, it's, it can't be easy to be able to make, I mean, it's hard for me as a reviewer yeah. because, well, you know it's like as well, people are going to write to you and they're going to say to you, hey, what what's the best GPU for this or what you know, and it's it's very hard because there's no sometimes there's no clear cut answer. It's like yeah. to do with their budget. It's the an to do the with answer like, is always it depends these days. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's even worse because if you were to look at like say AMD, mm -hmm. you know the single core performance not as good as Intel, but right. the right. the performance in terms of the multi threading side of things you've got sixty four. Uh, threads with a pretty decent price. It's it's so complex to be able to just say yeah. go Intel or go AMD or go you know go with this drive or whatever. It's, yeah, it's so. And that's why like we lead with our publications. So you can go to our website and you can read till you're blue in the face uh, about <laughs> a lot of the things that we test on. But ultimately, the way that we like to approach it is to have a one to one relationship with our customers because what we're gonna the easiest way to get to the bottom of what's best for you is to talk to you, and that's something that we feel is a like competitive advantage uh, with, with a smaller company because we can have those conversations. Like try, try calling Dell and having that conversation. Like it's just, they're just not at a scale where that makes, that is workable. Do you think that could be one area that could change for you over time as you, because one of the things I heard is you're growing around 20% per year. Yeah, yeah, pretty consistently. So if you obviously that, you five or six years in the future, do you think that could be like Yeah, that area? keeps coming up. Yeah, I, I, I keep, uh, so part of our internal mission statement is uh, we're gonna grow until this point. And uh, then we're gonna try, then that's, that's as big as I wanna be. I have no dreams to be another Dell. Like we want to be a size of company that is big enough to make a difference, but not so big that we don't care anymore. And so we really like kind of the size we're at. And what we've done over the last 10 years has been when we reach that point, we reevaluate. 
are, are we at a place where we can continue to grow? And so far, the answer has always been yes, that as we scale and build up more processes in our business that uh, we can continue to provide the customer experience we want while continuing to grow. And I hope that's going to be true for a while, but we'll keep asking that question. What do you think are some of the coolest things that you've been working on and that you can talk about? Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the problem. I was telling you earlier that the, the problem is that all the coolest app, uh, customer use cases we can't talk about, we're under uh, non-disclosure agreements for. Um, some of the coolest ones, we have one customer that uses our computers for um, LiDAR terrain mapping. <laughs> so fly over a valley, take LiDAR image or data point um, just take data points of the valley, take photographs, and you skin. Uh, it's basically it's basically like making Google Earth in real time. That's pretty and awesome. really cool applications. Like there's a if there's a dam that's at at risk of of bursting, they can fly over a valley and they can actually map out what's at risk of flooding. So that's one cool use case. Uh, another one we did we did a blog post on this was um, we um, have a customer who builds the machines for NASA astronaut training for EVAs when they go outside the International Space Station and they do training in VR. And it was cool not only to provide those boxes, that, but that we could send two of our guys down and they did the training. They were able to get in the VR environment and, and use it. That was really cool. What do you think of VR so far? Oh man, I think VR has a lot of promise. Um, I'm happy that it's surviving past the like toy phase, uh, <laughs> because what has me really excited is the professional applications. Right. I mean, yeah, it's it's great for gaming and VR, and there's there's gonna be movies coming up in VR and that type of thing. But to use VR for um, architecture or construction quality control, we have one of our one of our partners we're working with. They actually use augmented reality or VR to be able to quality control. You can walk into a construction scene and the augmented reality will tell you where the pipes are supposed to be. And, wow. and you can see, oh, well, they, they built that pipe wrong. Like really cool applications. That like is that. pretty awesome. So you don't suspect necessary gaming is going to adopt it as fast as professional or? I'm, I, well, I don't know. Um, honestly, I don't know. I, I, I'm just happy. I think it, like GeForce and Quadro, I think that the consumer end of things ends up funding funding the commercial side and so i'm just i'm just happy that the the consumer side has not tapered off that it's continuing to be strong enough that people are looking to these commercial applications and at some point we'll have a tipping point technology will progress like we go wireless on the vr headsets and the things get smaller and less less bulky more, um, it'll, less cumbersome it'll start to roll downhill we'll get more and more momentum behind it what was when you're all working with AIBs, what's their process there? As in, like, do you notice that it's harder to work with some? Obviously, you can't mention names, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's harder to burn bridges, and I don't want to yeah, burn bridges. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but do you notice it's harder to work with some AIBs, and it's easier with others, or do you feel that it doesn't make that much difference? Yeah, how, how... that's interesting. I don't know. I, I think just like anything else, there's everyone has strengths and weaknesses, and we're looking first and foremost for the relationship with the AIB. Um, because even if they don't have a product today that's a good fit for us, we want to have that relationship. It's actually really common for us to give feedback on a product that takes a couple of years for them to, to implement. But um, the role that we play is because we work with end users, we often be, are like an, an aggregator of feedback and we're an advocate for those end users. So I'll give an example. Um, we do a lot of like Xeon and like professional use case uh, workstations. Five years ago, it was so hard to find a Xeon workstation that wasn't just a server board that they called a workstation board. Mm. Workstations need a lot more I.O., USB ports and, dis and video inputs and outputs, sound, onboard sound, 10 gig network. And so we gave feedback to a lot of the AABs um, about that and pleased to see that five years later, I mean, we weren't, we weren't the only ones asking for that, but I'd like to think we played a part in now there's a lot of really nice workstation boards out today. And those, that's a big success for us when we can actually help steer the industry towards better products. That is also because obviously a lot of the HGTT stuff now is so close to the high end server boards and professional workstations as well. Like we yes, saw absolutely. Uh, Epic obviously uh, influenced Threadripper. I mean, from uh -huh. what we understand, t uh, Threadripper literally was like a passion project over at AMD. And sure. we're starting yeah, to see heard, yeah. Yeah, Skylake X as well. You know, very similar to a lot of the server boards, so it does mm -hmm. make a lot of sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, workstations are where consumer and enterprise collide, and so we like we live in the gray area, and so sometimes we pull from the consumer side, sometimes from the enterprise side, and we the packages that we put together are like we're we're trying to actually pull from the strengths of both. 
What would you say is one of the um, the hardest things about doing this type of work? Uh, with how quickly everything changes. I mean, we're, we have to be on top of very, very specific use cases. And so we have to, every time there's a hardware update, every time there's a software refresh, we kind of start all over. <laughs> and, and sometimes it ends up being very minor and no big deal. Um, other times, like, everything changes. And so, yeah, we, we put a lot of time and energy. We not only have to, like, we have to test that and then figure out how we're going to change our products, and then we have to train our entire company on what it has changed. One of the things that's important to us, it's, it's not just our lab's folks that have to know this it's everyone in the company we're an experienced company and so it's important to us that whether you call our tech consultants or whether you call our support technicians they have to know what you're talking about they have to know what rendering is and exporting and and uh, live playback and like all the all these words that um, um, until you really get into the use case it's hard to find somebody that knows what they're talking about what would you say um, is one of the biggest issues at the moment you find with your customers is in like one area you would like to see tackled by AMD, NVIDIA, whomever else, what would you like to see? Like perhaps mm. products or a solution that you feel is frustrating a lot of people. That's interesting. Well, I don't know. I mean, if I could, could I have anything I want? Well, as um. long as it's not like, you know, you press a button and gold yeah. is dispensed yeah, yeah, from yeah, a USB yeah. slot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's really helpful to us when we don't have to manage 60 processors. I mean, look at the Intel scalable line. It's so many processors and it's necessary. I mean, it's not almost like Intel's fault. Like it's necessary because when you have anything from a four core processor to whatever it is now, 24 core, I don't even know what it is. Um, there's so many different ways you can slice and dice that to be optimized for specific use cases that you end up with this huge product stack that's almost impossible to like know everything about or keep on top of and so i guess you know the the holy grail to me would be a responsive technology that's that can be single threaded sometimes and multi-threaded sometimes and um that we wouldn't have to have such a diversity of hardware to handle all these use cases. I think AMD in one respect actually nailed it really well with their product lineup. Uh -huh. You know, you have the Ryzen processors and then if we move to like Epic or Fridge Ripper, it's it's not difficult to really wrap your head around. I mean, the first generation, for example, of Fridge Ripper, you've got the 1920X, you've got the 1950s, yeah. and so on. And it's like, it makes sense. It's not it difficult to say, okay, well, this is a 12 core processor. This is a, you know, a 16 core processor or whatever. And it's very easy to be able to just. Yeah. And, and I love that they didn't play any games with like, differing numbers of PCI lanes yeah, per SKU. Was... Like having that homogeneous stack is really nice because then you're not trying to compare multiple variables at the same time. It's just how many cores do you need? Did that cause a lot of confusion as well with the way Intel segmented with that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And so I mean AMD kind of had an answer at the perfect time coming in with, with their stack. Like that was a perfect answer because it was a, a time of maximum confusion on the Intel yeah. side. I mean, what 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 the, what the heck did they do? The KB like processor. Yeah, yeah, four, exactly. Yeah, that's what everyone. Four cores and X two nine nine. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of what everyone said. <laughs> <laughs> what's good though is like this is this is exactly why we like competition in the market because what's happened is AMD came up with that, Intel had to respond, and we all win. Yeah. Um, from a situation like that. I mean, let's be honest. The worst thing is when. At the moment, for example, NVIDIA have pretty much the monopoly on the GPU side of mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there are some use cases of Vega, especially if it comes to like HPC and right. whatever. But right. until we see what Navi does or what you know 7NM Vega does, and we kind of get an idea, yeah. but no one really knows how well it performs, how well it's going to. You know, it it doesn't keep the other company honest. Right. Right. And that's not good for us. Yes. Yes. I mean, and frankly, it's not even good for the company. Like, no, like, like NVIDIA or Intel, because, um, you know, that what keeps a company strong is having to compete at that level. That's why Intel got rabbit punched, ultimately, by AMD, because they could have, I mean, if imagine if they would have kept pushing the CPU envelope every year, mm -hmm. you know. Untouchable. Yeah, uh -huh. it would have been, it would have been incredible. Imagine if they would have kept the, the jump from the 2500K to the, you know, blah, 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 sure, blah, blah. Sure, it would sure. have been, you know, we AMD would have had no no hope at all, but they just fell back, and obviously it 
kind of cost them a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was interesting too. The uh, like as the manufacturing process is getting, we're like, I know we've been saying this for ten years, but we're approaching the limits of physics. <laughs> um, and yeah, you know, so as as there's troubles getting down to a seven nanometer process, like that's also an opportunity mm-hmm. for AMD. And yeah, I mean, just ultimately, it's it's great to see competition again. <laughs> Would you say that um, the market is changing very much in terms of what consumers or people demand? Hmm. And I don't mean like in the hardware, I mean like what their expectations oh, are. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe not so much. I, I guess I don't know your audience as well as you do, but I would imagine a lot of tech enthusiasts, people that really appreciate mm-hmm. staying up on hardware. And so I think us tech enthusiasts are a little bit insulated from the rest of the world in that I think the rest of the world, the world's just getting faster and more complicated and people want to get their job done. If you're an engineer, uh, I think a lot of engineers couldn't care less what's in their box, what's in their hardware. It just, it has to get their simulations done. And so I think that's one thing that's, that's changed um, is that there's a lot less, not even like tech savviness, but a lot less even care for what the technology is, as long as it can get their job done reliably. So, is there anything you want to finalize and finish off with? Any final messages to everyone? Oh man, I don't know. Can I, that's a you know that's the toughest question you've answered. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I think just just uh, that we are here. Uh, the way that we approach the business is that we want to help the world, and one of the ways that we can help the world is to be an advocate for these content creators and scientists and getting their job done. Uh, but for tech enthusiasts, like we're not, we're not trying to be, like we don't want to sell everyone a computer. And, and te- tech enthusiasts um, are very much like what what we would like is to be helpful to you as well. Like the testing that we do, we are very deliberate to uh, go after benchmarking that you're not going to find anywhere else. Uh, it's easy to find gaming frames per second benchmarks. We don't do any of that because we want to we want to serve. Uh, purposes that aren't being served by somebody else and so if that's helpful to you then that's all we ask is like we want people to uh, check us out be helpful and if you find that we're a company that you can recommend and that that's all we ask from you okay well thanks very much for your time okay thank you i'd like to extend my thanks to john and puget systems once again for a chance of touring the facility and john's time for the interview if you're interested in some of their hardware and also their articles you can check out their link in the video description of this video of course with all of that said hopefully uh, i'll see you soon take care of yourselves bye for now